So now I'd like to introduce uh, Max Gully, former um, Managing Director of Virgin Insight. Over to you, Max. Thanks. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about location and with, with a kind of main emphasis on, on mobile telephony and data from it. So it all follows on beautifully as though we'd prepared it. Um, obviously, my, my starting point was going to be, oh, location, 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 how funny. I look a bit like Phil, all of that kind of stuff. And then I was going to start my presentation by talking about houses, and you're going to say, what the hell is he talking about? And then I was going to go, kidding. Now, it turns out, actually, when I got up this morning, put everything in my rucksack, came out the door, and then <laughs> shut my door with my wallet and my keys inside, which I, I <laughs> interestingly, don't recommend if you then have to travel anywhere. Um, so, you, you know, I'm pleased to be with you. Um, the, the other thing that I think is interesting for this presentation is uh, what I didn't leave inside was my mobile phone. Um, and I think that is the, the way the world is changing. And, and the reality is your mobile phone is going to be your wallet relatively soon, whether that's Visa, whether that's Google, whether that is um, one of the networks or all the portfolio of networks together. That's going to happen. Um, so it's just a, a, a matter of when. Um, I'm going to talk um, broad about some big data things, and then I'm going to get narrow about mobile data. So hopefully you'll find that fun and interesting. Um, the first thing about big data is that it's not about big data. It's only about making better decisions in an organization to generate more cash. That's all it's about. And the reality is you can also do that with small data. Y you know, all of this glamour and excitement about big data. Um, yes, it does allow you to do some new answers to questions. But generally speaking, the questions are the same. Not always, but mostly they are. Um, so really, it's about the right data and the right question and the right analysis. So um, a lot of what we're talking about, it's really what's going to be the use case? How is that going to be beneficial for me um, so I can make a decision that's different than I would have done that will generate me more profit? And if I don't do that, then I don't need that information. That's generally speaking what we were looking at when I was at Virgin is it all of that, and I know there's some academics in the room, so forgive me, but all of that, um, it's very interesting to find out, and then we can't do anything with it, is not good enough um, to invest cash in in a business. So um, it's and actually one of the most interesting things is getting the right question. So what are you supposed to be answering? Um, because, and, and, and so you can either go in and say, well, I'll be hypothesis-led, I'll have an, a question with a hypothesis answer and I'll, I'll, I'll validate or, or um, negate that, that, that hypothesis. Or alternatively, I'll do the opposite and I, I will boil the ocean and see what comes out of it. And boiling the ocean and seeing what comes out of it is pretty interesting. You actually get more, probably ultimately much more interesting results. But it's very expensive in terms of time and effort. So generally speaking, people are going to go hypothesis-led in organisations with a business question, answer it, move on, having made the decision. So why should I be standing up in front of you talking about mobile telephony data and how it can be used rather than a mobile telephone company? Um, and uh, the answer is because Keith doesn't like people who are, who are peddling stuff to be up standing here, and I'm not peddling anything when it comes to mobile data. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about me. So I was at Virgin until the end of last year. I was there for 12 years. My job initially was to start up new Virgin companies around the world, which was all very glamorous, getting on planes and you know, hiring management teams and, and raising cash and starting companies, and then doing the strategy for the group. And then more recently, I got stuck into Virgin Insight, which is a company that I founded. Um, and what it was about was pulling together the data from all of the Virgin companies and putting it into one pot and then doing uh, analytics to answer questions that the Virgin companies have. Now, the perception of Virgin is it's one big red house with Richard Branson at the top, and, you know, having a lovely time, and everyone works there having a lovely time. And the reality is they're fighting like siblings. Um, you know, they're all different companies. They've got the Virgin brand above the door, sometimes majority owned, sometimes not. And so uh, the idea that they might work together was quite a novel one. 
Um, so this was about 2007. And in 2007, there was a question with, should we have a loyalty card? So think Nectar painted red with Virgin on the corner. And the answer from the managing directors of all the Virgin companies was no. But we'd like all the benefits. So we'd like to have more customers. We'd like to have less churn. We'd like to have more valuable customers, all of those things. So we actually pulled the data for the first time and formed Virgin Insight, which was uh, formed on the belief that if you really understand customers and put them at the heart of the business, which was really what the Virgin brand was about, but you do that with some science, then you can actually deliver understanding that allows you to make better business decisions, and that's specifically around strategy and marketing. And we pulled in the data from a bunch of the different companies and just a few case studies. Amazingly, when asked how many customers do you think have got multiple relationships within Virgin, um, we did, I did a show of hands in a room not dissimilar to this to all the guys who ran the Virgin companies, and they said, oh, maybe 50%, maybe three quarters, and the answer was 8%. And so the reality was the Virgin Group was not functioning as a group of co well, it was functioning as a group of companies rather than a single brand. So we uh, helped them do a whole portfolio of collaboration, some of it strategic, but most of it tactical. We saw that number triple, and actually, if you worked out the revenue associated with that triple, tripling, it was about 900 million of, uh, of annual revenue. So it was a decent chunk of change. Um, but then we had all of this data, and if you think about Virgin, just going back, we, we know where people fly to, we know who they go with, we know when they book, we know how often they go to the gym, we know what they spend their money on, we know what they save, uh, we know where they travel on the train, what they spend on the credit card. And actually with Virgin Media, although we didn't have this data um, for privacy issues, and I will come back to that, you know what they watch on TV, you know what they look at on the internet, and also who they phone. So if you think about that as a combined level of understanding of consumers, and we overlaid all of the demographic information from uh, Experian, it was a pretty interesting set of stuff that we knew. Um, and we were able to do lots of interesting things. So one of the things we did was look at um, catchment areas. Uh, we did, a, we did um, a model for everyone in the UK as to how likely they were to take any product, any product at all. You dropped in the product type at the top with the customers who had it and out the bottom came from one to 48 million. Those people who weren't already your customers, how likely they were to purchase. Did drive time analysis around that and that allowed us to do Lloyd's TSB. Anyone from Lloyd's in the room? No, that was a terrible portfolio of things they were selling. Um, uh, so there was 200 good ones, which was Cheltenham Gloucester portfolio and 400 terrible banks. So um, now they, they didn't sell it to co-op, that didn't go through, and now they've, they've rebranded as, uh, as TSB and we'll float that separately. Um, we did a very similar thing with Virgin Holidays, so rolled out 100 stores there. Just said, where, where, are the, where are their potential customers, where are their current customers, and then did drive time analysis around all of the 1,500 towns in the UK, did, did, did some stuff around which I'm sure David will, um, would would roll his eyes out terribly about overlaps and, and how to kind of buffer between different things. And, and, and a good store was two million turnover and a bad store was a million turnover. So now they're t turning over 200 million through that portfolio, which is very weird from 2007 standing star that they were rolling out stores when everything's going online. But they did it in a very neat way, which is stores within stores of Tesco's House of Fraser and Debenhams. We did a lot of work on the, um, the bid for Virgin Trains. Um, it turns out it's quite important to get the numbers right. Um, <laughs> uh, we hope we did. <laughs> um, and the last one there, which was also quite a neat little um, thing, was uh, on the acquisition of a sporter by Virgin Holidays. Um, we did a portfolio of stuff like, you know, competition commission, are we creating localised monopolies? And we proved to the commission that we weren't. But um, things also like, uh, oh, where to spend the cash? So you've got CapEx, you've got a new gym chain, you've got 55 gyms. It's like, okay, you can walk in. Do I put a new shower block in? Do I put more cash onto the gym floor? Is the pool okay? And the answer was, it was just gonna be anecdotal. But what we were able to say was, there's 20,000 comments sitting in, um, in, their, in, in the sporter systems that they've never looked at. And so we, we thought, right, first thing we do is do some sentiment analysis. And the answer was all the sentiment was negative. Uh, <laughs> no one likes their gym, apart from staff. So some of the staff stuff was good. 
Um, but we, we were then able to say across 16 different categories, red, amber, green, was this a good performing gym? And if it was, had a crappy shower block, then that allowed the regional manager to go in there and say, we'll spend the cash on rebranding, you know, nice name above the door and all of that stuff, but we'll also put in a new shower block so that people feel good about this gym. So we did a whole portfolio of stuff at Virgin Insight. And uh, I left there at the end of last year, ironically, because they were thinking about launching a loyalty card. And I said I didn't want to run a loyalty business. So um, I'm now looking at doing a, a couple of different startups. But as part of that, I found out a, a lot about data, big data anyway, from what I was doing. Um, and um, I happen to know a lot of the guys at the mobile operator. So I'll talk that through. So the broader view, um, what people have been doing with data uh, for the past few years primarily is getting their own house in order and have tended to, to view the universe as them at the centre and then they work out, you know, what they look like. So they want their name and address data sorted out and then they want link in, link in transactional data um, and then they want to know if they've done marketing campaigns, what the response rates have been, um, and beginning to do customer feedback, NPS scores, understanding whether people like them or don't. Um, maybe integrating call centers information, so calls and emails, maybe doing some um, analytics on that, text analytics to understand problems, looking at that, how that relates to NPS scores and optimizing the customer journey. Uh, and then say, oh, God, we better put in all of that web tracking data that we're getting, so we'll tag up our site and we'll integrate all of that as well. And then kind of going off the shelf and going to Axiom or Experian or um, Call Credit or any of these guys, CACI, and, and appending all of the demographic information. So that's the single customer view that people have been playing around with. It's been a bit of a pain in the ass to get sorted out but for most companies because all of this data is from different operational systems. If you go into somewhere like, um, you know, I remember, I think I heard O2's got something like 4,000 operational systems that it's trying to integrate, you know, it's just a mess. So getting this, a single view of the truth has been quite challenging for most organisations. Um, but why are they doing that? And, and, and actually, all of this data stuff, people are getting, as I say, uh, frothy at the mouth about it, talking about Hadoop and Hive and Pig and Cassandra and all of these things. And actually, it's not about that. It's about making better decisions. And the decisions only come down to, and again, sorry if the government in the room here not necessarily only do this, but taking a step back, it comes down to profit. And profit only breaks into two different areas, revenue and costs. Is, are the decisions that you can take improved in either the revenue side of the equation or the cost. And if they aren't, then don't bother doing the an analytics or finding the data. On the revenue side, as and you know, please do challenge me at this towards the end, um, but I think there is probably only two areas on revenue that are relevant for data. Strategy and um, new business development and sales and marketing. On the cost side, um, it's operational excellence, supply chain, um, logistics, anything like that or risk and fraud. And then in the middle, the one that kind of transcends on both sides is customer experience and customer service. And those are the five different areas in which pretty much all of the decisions that can be taken in order to enhance a business can be sat. And if you think about those areas, pretty much all of those areas are already addressed five years ago in some shape or form. And that's where I say the questions haven't really changed, but the answers can be more enhanced now. So strategy, you've got the Booz, McKinsey, Bain, all of those guys playing around in that market, the Strat houses. Sales and marketing, here, this world is getting turned up on, upside down on its head, not least because the online and digital world changing so dramatically, but, but also just the data allows you to be much more specific in targeting. Um, on the right-hand side there, risk and fraud, you know, your Equifax is your experience. They've been doing this for years. Um, some of it's getting a little enhanced, so we'll talk, I'll talk about that a little bit later with some mobile stuff, but basically that's been around. OR has been operational research at universities, that's been around for years. If you think FedEx or a train company or whatever, those guys have really had to optimise their analytics around data for years. Um, customer experience, you know, optimization of customer service, that's been around uh, for a period of time as well. So a, a lot of what people are worrying about is still the same questions, it's just meaning that you can answer some of those questions uh, in, a, in a better way. And one of the things that you can do 
now is start not to look at just yourself and you as the centre of the universe, but look at the universe as a whole. And um, the mobile guys, but I'm going to talk about that last, the mobile guys do have some very interesting data here, but other people do as well. So the kind of data that people have got, so the FS guys have every single piece of cash that, it, that is transacted. So you've got Visa, Mastercard Consulting, Amex Consulting, you've got all of those guys who are trying to commercialise the, the customer data. Interestingly, you had Barclay Card coming out and telling people that they were going to commercialise their data over the summer, not necessarily the best PR approach, in my humble opinion. But they are, um, they are now beginning to work out how you can use spend data, either at the aggregator or anonymised level or at the personal level, so there's a company called Cardlytics that you might want to take a look at, which is using the information that you're spending if you've opted in to put advertising in your statement as you check your statement so that you can actually um, uh, get adverts that are tailored to you based on your actual spend. So it's like Google and Gmail, but based on what's actually going on in your account. So that's quite spooky stuff, and we'll come back to spooky in a minute. Web browsing, so Hitwise is a company that's owned by Experian, um, which is using ISP data on an aggregate anonymized basis in order to understand what's going on. I'm surprised that more isn't happening with this tracking data. So people are doing a lot of work in their own companies with tagging information, but um, a lot of that marketing attribution is, <coughs> is focused on the last click. So where did someone come to me? for the final clip before they came onto my site. And they're attributing um, the, the marketing value to that final click. Now that's not the truth. The truth is you've had a whole journey uh, uh, in a variety of different places, then you get onto the site and then you go off and do a whole bunch of other stuff. Actually, you know, understanding those total journeys is what's gonna be important to optimize business outcome. So there'll be more commercialized stuff here, but there's lots of activity in that area. TV viewing, this is uh, um, the Virgin Media Box, uh, and they're looking at commercialising the set-top box stuff. Sky have already announced that they're launching localised um, TV advert adverts. So what happens is you get broadcast from the sky onto a box, um, the, the portfolio of adverts. It knows what your demographics are for your postcode. And, and in a programme, they cut either side of the programme so they know the ad break, and then they insert on a dynamic basis, the ads that they want to sit in there. And that is going, it, that's either live or going live right now. So that, that is also changing the way that advertising works. Um, you've got the loyalty cards. These guys have been around for ages. So you've got um, the, the Nexus that we referred to earlier on. Um, but you've got Dunhumby, who's been doing this in 97 with Tesco's. You've got Boots. I think there's some Boots people in the room. Those are the main three, to be honest. They're all about 18 million. So when I shout out 18 million, that's the total universe of those three each. You drop down to about five million with BA, um, uh, with uh, Avios. So if you want to launch a loyalty company, then if you use Boots, Nectar, and Tesco as your example, they are the outlier rather than the norm. But uh, they've got some great data. They've got some great SKU data. Um, that's all sell, sold back up to the FMCG guys. They make a lot of money doing that. Um, so they're quite interesting businesses as well. And you've got social. Social's interesting. I've never been absolutely sold on this. So um, Radian 6, there's a company that sold to Salesforce just at the peak of the, the bubble in this area. The bubble has more or less popped. Um, and people are saying, well, what can I actually do with social? On social, there's some great stuff to do with customer care. If people are complaining, you have to address that. Um, if you want to do some PR messaging, you can think about that. But, but actually, using it as a forward indicator for any kind of behavior. It's quite good for crisis, you know, understanding what's happening as a crisis is unfolding. But I'm not completely sold on using that kind of scale of data. So a lot of, a lot of people talking about how social is really a great source of data. Um, but I'm not completely sold on that. And I think the final one, which I'll now flick a bit more into, into detail on, is, is the mobile world. Um, and rather than to over talk that, if, having said all of this, you go, Christ, that's a lot of data, and that's a bit scary. Well, yes, it is. If you pull all of this together, this is more than the US government has, 
um, in, in their prison um, environment. And they're only taking the metadata, and some of what I'm talking about here is not the metadata, it's the actual data. So those ISP web logs, that's the entire web log, so it's every URL that that individual has clicked. So a really important thing in this universe is to know what is personal and then what is aggregated and anonymized. And aggregated and anonymized is like market research, provided the aggregation is large enough. But personal, oh my God, some of this stuff is really personal. My per, my indi, my, how I test this is if I knew that was happening for my data and I hadn't given, or even if I have given notional permission, so it's not about real you know, consent, tick the box, oh yes, I'm fine. It's not that. It really isn't that. It is, have I made the bond, is my bond of trust with the, with the person who has this data, is that kind of clear bond of trust? Um, do I understand within that that my data is being used and monetized in different ways? And, and, and the answer often, I think, is, is no. So I, I, I did a presentation on data protection about a year ago and said that this is, or maybe a year and a half ago, and said this is going to be front page news for, for a brand. And I said it was one of the brands in the room just to be a bit, uh, bit um, you know, <laughs> get everyone's attention in terms of it was the American government instead. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but, but this will happen again, and it may well be one of the brands in this room, and uh, particularly with some of this mobile, and um, we've got some of the mobile guys here, I wouldn't be surprised if when people realise what's happening with their mobile phone data, they go, holy shit. And, uh, and that is then front page news. Um, uh, so not going to do that. Um, <laughs> I said that. Uh, so... Um, What's going to happen is there's going to be data pools of both internal and external data, but ultimately they'll be aggregated into apps that, and applications in its broadest sense. Not Don't think app that sits on a, an iPad or a phone, but app, business applications. So it allows you to do something better. Smart Steps that we've seen, and I'll come on to in a little bit, is one of those examples. So um, uh, Smart Steps is, is saying... For retailers specifically, where are my consumers? Where are they moving? Now, the reality there is it's not tailored enough for an application. So me as M&S or Tesco's or Sainsbury's or whoever isn't able to say, and I will make a different decision today because of this information. Um, so, but, but Telefonica are evolving that to make that the case. So this is the kind of world we're going into. So mobile, the point of my presentation. Five minutes to go. The players. <laughs> so the players. I, 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 I've spoken to um, the E guys, the three of them here. So if you want to know more about it, you can speak to them afterwards. There's someone from Telefonica here. Uh, and actually Ben is doing some work with them as well. So that's O2. Vodafone are kind of putting their toe in the water with Experian. And there's also then this thing called Weave. So I've got kind of elements of their presentations because I know most of these guys and so I can talk through a little bit. We've, say, mobile phones are being used, a bit like Google saying the internet is being used. We want to say that mobile phones are being used so you spend more money on advertising on mobile phones. But it is kind of a given. Um, this is experience, um, which you can't see, Experian have said, OK, this is an example of what an individual will do. And so they pitch up at London at 9.30, go to Oxford Circus, then go to the Apple store, go inside the store, go to a few other places on Regent Street, and then um, uh, having a coffee in Starbucks a little later on. If you start saying, OK, well, first of all, you've got the information. If this is an individual person who you know, so a registered user... So you've got name and address, and because you've got name and address, you can attach all of that wonderful Experian data, so earnings, directorships, all of those, one, you know, how long they've been in their home. So you know, name and address, age, gender, contract type, payment history, demographic type, all of that stuff, as well as you know, your mosaic or your cameos or your acorns. So that's what we did in the, in the old world. But now, and this becomes quite frightening quite quickly, is... You know, you know they're at Oxford Street at 9.30, they're outside the Apple Store. Now, it does depend on whether it's GPS-enabled or it's cell site-based. If it's cell-based, you know generally where they are in the area. If it's GPS, you know very specifically where they are. Um, 
they then send a text. Um, and you know the number that they send that text to. Um, they then search on Google for iPhone 5 prices. Um, and that you do see. So everything everywhere do have browser data. Uh, the other guys don't actually integrate their browser data at the moment, but, but, but everything everywhere do. Um, you then actually can see that they clicked onto Amazon, so you know what they're doing inside the store and where they are. Um, and, uh, and then you know that they're moving on onto Regent Street, and then you know that they're in Starbucks. Um, and then they sit down, and whilst they're in Starbucks, they watch last night's highlights of, uh, of the match on TV. So that is the kind of information that you can get. Now that's bloody scary if you think about those digital breadcrumbs that you're leaving behind you. So um, there's the interesting world where you go, oh, God, that's great. We can do some really interesting things. But the frightening world, which is um, civil liberties, do I want people to know? Have I actually given real consent? Um, do I trust people who've got this information, not just mobile, but all of those other kind of companies, to use this kind of data? And the answer, I think, is it's still a muddy area here. Um, just what are the individual companies doing? So Everything Everywhere, has a, um, they're, they're using mData as their kind of team who are commercialising um, the, the data they've got. They're then using Weave as their advertising, and then they're also looking at using um, mobile data in new and interesting ways to develop new businesses. Just a couple of their examples. Um, they, they've done some work. They did some work around the Olympics um, to understand what was going along in terms of uh, both where people were and then what they were looking at, whether we, they were using Facebook, whether they were tweeting around what particular you know, athletic events. So some pretty interesting stuff. Some shopping stuff on Tottenham Court Road. They've done some event stuff at Wembley, all sorts of interesting stuff. We saw, I think Ben put up a slide earlier on about some of the kind of traffic stuff that was going on. You can do loads on events, um, and government absolutely should be doing a lot around using this kind of data. And then um, a slightly weaker case study is just, you know, what TV and mobile, how people are interacting with that kind of stuff. But again, they've been able to do some stuff there. It's an interesting area. Everything Everywhere is a, is a combination of both France Telecom and Deutsche Telekom. Because of that, it's unclear what their future will be. They can speak to them if they, if they, they disagree. Um, unclear to, as to what their future is going to be in terms of how they will commercialise it uh, on an ongoing basis because the, the, the corporate structure is, is in, not in flux but is not absolutely clear. Next one is Telefonica. Telefonica Dynamic Insight, the owners of A2 is Telefonica. They've created something called Telefonica Dig uh, Digital, and within their Dynamic Insight is what, they use, what they're commercialising their data. They've got 150 people in there working out how to commercialise their data. It's a lot of people. They're spending about 2 million quid a month building shit. I mean, it's really huge. Um, the, the, one of the issues, and Ben's doing part of it, uh, one of the issues is, um, is that uh, they really need to commercialise it. So they need to be able to sell it. And that means you need to be nailing needs of business people. Uh, and, and so th these are some of their slides. So privacy is obviously something that's strongly on their mind. They've done quite a lot of work about catchment, which is um, very similar. Those, those rings are very similar to what we saw earlier on talking about Footfall. So Experian actually has a company called Footfall. That will go out of business because this stuff just wipes it out. But they're aware of that. Um, and then they're talking about some use cases. So opening hours, I think we had some allusion to that earlier on. Some DM optimizations, quite nice. You know, If you know where people are, then you can DM more effectively. That's just quite a nice kind of cross different, um, uh, kind of like total retail, retail earlier on. It's kind of across different media and event planning. So I, my, my view is that Telefonica is probably the heaviest invested in this. They've got the data in the best shape, uh, and they're productizing this in the most sophisticated manner. However, they don't have the browser data that Everything Everywhere does. So that is kind of a little bit of a difference. Um, Weave are uh, a, a, an astonishing thing, to be honest. Uh, I don't know whether... Uh, hands in the air, who has heard of Weave? How? how? God, almost no one. Right. So Weave is a joint venture between Everything Everywhere, Vodafone, and O2. That sounds like a cartel. 
Um, it isn't. It's gone to the, the European Commission and they've said it's not a cartel, but it does sound like one. Um, and, uh, and what they're doing is they're pooling all of their data. Imagine that, all of their data. They've got 70 million opted in people. I'm not sure those people realize they're opted in, but they are. Um, and they are able to then target mobile communication or banner advertising. And what they want to do is essentially become the mobile platform of choice for any brand. So you can then communicate using very sophisticated segmentations. That's the demographics, the behavioral stuff that we've talked about, the locational stuff, and we've categorization. So using a whole bunch of stuff in order to be able to target people and then pooling lots of data and then, and then targeting. And a number of these brands down the bottom, they've got some interesting case studies that exist. They're mostly, they're primarily awareness builders at the moment with some kind of cross-platform stuff but mostly it's kind of awareness building. So th very interesting, not sure whether it's gonna work. There may be a massive consumer backlash at some stage, but this stuff is happening and it's happening now. And there's 17 million people who can be contacted. The other one is Experian, interesting kind of little kind of swerve ball. Um, uh, Vodafone have decided not to do this themselves. And so they've signed a, a venture a agreement with uh, Experian to commercialize their data. Everything Everywhere are also working with Experian on this. The only ones who aren't is, is Telefonica because they've said, look, we're just doing this ourselves. So that's an interesting thing. So it'd be interesting to see what comes out of here. Experian are a large organization who are relatively slow, but they're very trusted. They've got a large client network, so they may well deliver some interesting services down the line, but it will take a bit of time. So better decisions in the mobile environment is, um, yes, you can do a number of things within strategy and business. You can look at market share, you can look at footfall, you can look at store locations, you can look at opening hours. So there's some bunch of stuff that you can do there. Sales and marketing, without a doubt, mobile ads, and that's Weave's whole premise. That, by the way, 1.6 billion pounds worth of mobile advertising assumed in 2016 or something. It's a big number. Um, but you can also, so the outdoor, now you know where people are and who they are, you can say what posters they should be looking at. So the outdoor market, that lovely little cosy JC Deco, um, uh, wonderful little control of pricing, you know, brown paper envelopes, hope no one's in the room, um, is, should get cleaned up a bit. Um, customer experience, you know, store location of footfall again. Um, operational excellence, um, definitely movement of traffic, movement of crowds, and that has some relevance for um, a variety of different people. And, and, and interestingly, Experian have talked about some credit fraud. So if you know that someone's phone is in a store where that transaction is occurring, then it's much, likely, much less likely that that's a fraudulent transaction. Um, some key industries where this will affect, this kind of data will be useful and will affect um, how people behave how businesses behave. Retail is clearly one. Transport is another. Advertising, definitely. Advertisers will have to just include this as a portfolio of their, A, their understanding, but also B, their communications, and events and government. That's not the total universe. I'm not absolutely convinced that they're hugely strong um, use cases. Uh, so there are some use cases I've put up here, but I that there's some much stronger ones if you're using financial services data or set-top box data than necessarily mobile data. But, but it is going to impact um, a bunch of different industries, and I do think retail should take it reasonably seriously. Um, some thoughts on the proposition, then, then I close after this one. So one thing is all of this data exists out there. Um, do you want it as... How much are you going to get involved versus um, whoever's supplying it to you? And, and what's the nature of that involvement? So is it a bespoke piece of analytics that's a um, consultancy service that takes months to do and actually can be quite fundamental for your organization? Or is it some real-time automated stuff that's trigger-based, depending on what people do? We know that they're walking past the retail um, store on Oxford Street. Should we be messaging them? So there's definitely different models there. The, the, other, way, the other thing to think about is on... Um, payment for this stuff, if you are engaging with any of the mobile operators or any of these providers, then you, there's probably three different ways, I mean there's probably more, but time and materials, if it's a consulting project, is the norm, although because this is early days, proof of concepts are out there and relatively cheap, so, you know, twist an arm, get a deal. 
Uh, subscription, if it's a productized service that you're making available to a bunch of people, it'll often be subscription based. And the final one is revenue share and, and something like the advertising that Weave is doing, they, you may well be able to negotiate some sort of share of, on, based on success rather than necessarily just on number of uh, views or clicks. So my closing thoughts, you'll be delighted to hear, Keith, is are... Ah, um, New services are coming out to help understand the total universe, not just your own you know, view of the universe, but the total universe, so your competitors and where you sit within that. And um, they are looking to capitalise on it, but they are only able to do that if they're delivering you value, so that is something that, that, that they should be aiming to do. Privacy is a massive, massive concern in this area and many other areas of data. Um, so go in with your eyes open and you must have thought it through. Don't let it happen to you by default because <laughs> it will be a car crash. Um, mobile operators um, are making inroads but it's early days uh, and that means you can cut deals. You can do some interesting stuff but conversely it might be a bit clunky um, and it's more relevant to some than others. Um, uh, so it depends really whether there are real use cases and ultimately that's about whether you can make better decisions in your business, organisation, government department, whatever, so that something changes so that you can make more money. Um, that's all I've got to say. Um, come and have a chat. I'm just to let you know what I'm doing now. I'm looking at a, um, a couple of different startups. One's a hedge fund and another is... Um, retail information provider so if any of the retailers want to have a chat about that and get some sort of understanding then do come and have a chat with me but that i think yes is everything i've got to say so thank you any questions from the floor Thanks. Uh, David Ryan, UK Statistics Authority. Fascinating. Thanks for that. Um, I'm particularly interested in creating information that flows through government and gets used there. You touched on it uh, uh, lightly in one or two places. Um, in particular, I'd like to know what proxies we can get for this data from some, for some of the major government series. We must be able to collect things more efficiently. Yes. So any thoughts on that would be useful. And, and what are the incentive mechanisms for commercial players, other than money, if there isn't one, uh, what are the incentives for um, commercial players um, working together closely with government? Um, so on the first one, I'd be willing to take a bet with anyone here that there won't be a census ever again. Um, uh, just, I just don't see what the point would be. Um, <laughs> But fortunately, I'll take that bet, and we've got 10 years before we find out, so <laughs> I'll be doing something else. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but I do think the level of understanding, for, particularly from those data sources that you can get, are huge. Uh, a pal of mine um, came in when we were doing the identity cards, and he was working for PA Consultant. And the identity cards was, he said, what's the benefit case for identity cards? And, and there wasn't one. And that was a bit embarrassing. And this was a, the kind of six months before it finished. Um, the, 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 I think one of the interesting things for government is, have you got a unique identifier? And one of the things that I thought would be a unique identifier is national insurance number. But it turns out I was told that that isn't. Or my, you know, my tax number. But once you can start attaching some of this stuff, even if it's network attaching, um, then you can start building this stuff out. And, uh, and it just seems like such a no-brainer. And it should be very cheap. I wouldn't go to I wouldn't go to Accenture or IBM again. Apologies, but um, I would go. I would be you know obviously you have to get over the security issues, but putting it within you know the Google environment or the Amazon environment, it is cheap, cheap stuff now. So that's that you know from a from an infrastructural and kind of um, you know a matching issue. The separate thing, which is how do you get them to to cooperate? I loved the a friend of mine's a CIO at the um, FCA. 
And he said, uh, if, we, if we want something from the banks, we just tell them. And if they don't do it, we pass an act of parliament, which I, <laughs> I thought was a nice way of doing it. But, 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 but actually, these I mean, companies go through their government, you know, they want to have nice relationships with government. And so you, you go through their government liaison departments and pay them a very small amount of money and they'll cooperate enormously. And I, I just don't think that's going to be expensive at all. Hi, Ma uh, Martin Clark from University of Leeds. Um, you, you talk as though everybody who has a phone is the owner of that phone. Um, uh, a large proportion of mobile phones are owned by corporations. And just as an example, my two children who are at university have mobile phones which are registered in my name and I pay their bills every month. So there are, you know, there's a bit of a grey area sure. in some of this. And um, I don't think it's as clear cut as, you know, you know, mobile phone data just replaces everything else kind of thing. Oh, I no, I, I mean, as I say, I think the use cases aren't necessarily massively strong, um, for, but there are some good ones. I, I suppose it's always that case of what, what's the incremental benefit you get versus what you've currently got. And, and, and if there is a strong incremental benefit, and, and it delivers me lots of profit, then I'm going to pay, pay you for that, um, Mr. Mr. Nice Operator, for giving me that information. But if, but if it's a marginal benefit, then I'm not going to pay you. And, and, and I don't think that the operators quite know yet how valuable what they've got is. It might not be. And certainly for some in instances, it won't be. There's a couple more there. Mark Martin Callingham, um, you gave an example of somebody going to Oxford Street and shopping down uh, Re Oxford Circus and shopping down Regent Street. So there was a sequence of events and a sequence a sequence of events. Do you know anybody who has actually analysed data of that type in which the sequence is held or used as an analytical variable? No, I, I don't actually. It's really complicated. <laughs> Um, there's lots of no we, we you know we 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 kind of ping ping um, pinball through life so it's not a an obvious sequence. Um, it's similar for, I think through the analysis of URLs as people are going through the web they'll go off all over the place and actually un seeing really clear meaningful actionable um, analytics of that I haven't really seen that anywhere. It was it was an example. Um, from from Experian, and, and clearly it's a it's a it's a it's it's kind of what what people would like to occur. Actually, that, I, and I tell a lie. I have seen Google do some of that um, with their with their analytics when they're talking about um, when they were selling to Virgin Atlantic. They were saying we can see over a period of time how people are searching for holidays and how their holiday search is narrow. So that is some of that journey, but it's not, I mean, the, the detail that was in there, I just, I mean, it's so hard. I mean, I'm sure there are brains in the room that can do this kind of stuff, but I don't, I, it's really hard. Hey, Simon Vaux from EE. Um, I kind of see now table six seems to be the uh, mobile telcos table, I've realized. Um, I thought just more of a comment than a question, um, just perhaps in the, with a right of reply uh, for, the, uh, for those of us in the sector. Um, I thought I'd just touch back on the area of uh, the privacy um, and just from, from inside the, the mobile operators. Um, certainly I've worked in both Vodafone and now at EE as well. Um, the privacy of our customers is absolutely sacrosanct in this, in this area. Um, and I just wanted to go on record to say that actually Nobody within, as far as I know, any of the mobile operators, certainly within our own organisation, is analysing people's web traffic at individually identifiable level unless they've explicitly consented um, to that actually happening. Because uh, there's huge power, and a lot of the use cases that, that have been uh, exposed up there can all be done with the data totally anonymised. Yeah. Um, so. I think that's absolutely right, and it, the brand damage they could do to anyone is so colossal that, it, you know, in terms of the, the revenue or the profitability generated from some of this stuff compared to the, the brand damage it would do, it would be, it would be really strange to, to disrupt that. Well, thank you very much indeed.
So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Harvey Lewis, who's the Insight Research Director at Deloitte. Harvey, over to you. Thanks, Ben. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Harvey Lewis. I'm the Research Director for Deloitte Analytics, and I do research in two principal areas, into data and analytics itself, but also looking at business challenges that our clients have and using data to help address those. And in good, seamless fashion, my presentation is going to follow on, I hope, very well from Max's. In particular, I'm going to be looking at questions. And some of those questions are for you, and some of those are rhetorical. And I'm also going to be looking at what is the right data, because those two things are really the only considerations when it comes to making better decisions. So, my first question to you is, how much data is out there? Does anyone know how much data there is? Well, according to research, it's about two and a half zettabytes. And I don't know about you, but zettabyte sounds something quite difficult to get hold of, uh, and two and a half of them doesn't sound like very much at all. But I want to put it into some context for you. So two and a half zettabytes, if you were to convert that amount of data to text, and then print that text as a series of books, of paperback-sized books, you'll get a pile of books that would stretch from the Earth to Pluto and back more than 16 times. And the image on the screen is actually NASA's uh, New Horizons probe being launched in 2006, and it will arrive at Pluto in July 2015. And that's a journey of nine and a half years. Now, the rate at which we are generating data of all forms means that our imaginary pile of books, if we were to print those books at the rate at which we are generating data today, that pile would reach Pluto in less than a month. So this is my suggestion to NASA as a new launch mechanism for, <laughs> for getting uh, probes to uh, foreign planets. And it, when we look at the sorts of data that is contributing to this fantastic universe, you know, we, we've heard some examples today. You know, the, the 170,000 tweets per minute, the 700,000 updates on Facebook every minute, most of them, I think, by my wife on a Saturday evening. Um, that data is, is just enormous. It's very difficult to, to conceive. But what is fundamental to better decision-making is making sure that you have the right data. And I want to look at a, a really good lesson from the past uh, and this is London in 1854. And some of you may know where I'm heading with this. Um, who's heard of Dr. John Snow? Okay, so classic example. And I just want to, to use it to, to illustrate some, some key points about data and analytics. And what was important about Dr. John Snow's work wasn't actually just that... Um, he collected or used data. Um, what was important were two things. Firstly, his hypothesis, the question that he was asking, which was what role did that water pump in Broad Street play in the cholera deaths? And he plotted the data on the map, and this is one of his famous maps. But that wasn't enough to convince the authorities what he actually did and, and made the real difference was he looked at what we would now call drive time, journey time. His insight was that the pump on Broad Street was the closest in terms of journey time for these people. Because when you looked at the map of deaths, it wasn't obvious. But when you factored in that information, the insight leapt out. And as a consequence, London's uh, antiquated or non-existent sewage system was updated. And actually, that update transformed the sewage systems of many cities around the world in subsequent years. And the point here 
is that this is about making sure that you have the right data and that you're asking the right questions. And if they can do it 150 years ago, then we can do it today, no matter what size of data we're looking at. So I'm going to look at two areas in particular, open data and mobile data. And I do a lot of research into open data. And it's a really interesting and evolving world. And I, I'd like you to think about this whole universe, this world of data, as a new, unexplored world. And these few portals here are just a, a number of ways into that world. And when you look at the quantity of data that is now available as open data, it is absolutely staggering. So on data.gov.uk, for instance, they crossed the 10,000 data set mark only a couple of months ago. The website quandle.com has more than 6 million data sets from around the world. So you can look up demographic data, health data, economic data from myriad countries around the world. It is an incredible resource. But the challenge is, is, is it the right data? So we looked at um, data from three of the UK's largest portals last year, looking at what was being published and what was being used. And there's a real difference. And the question here is, is government releasing data that is useful, that is, that is going to be used to make those business decisions? And you can see from, from the plot here that about 30%, about a third of the data that the government releases is about government spending. But that represents less than 5% of the use. And actually, it's, it's really quite nice to see that the demographic and economic and labour market data is what is really in use, but is sort of substantially underrepresented in terms of efforts of the government. What's important about open data is it, it, is, it is incredibly complex. And if you're an explorer for, to a new world, you probably wouldn't want to do that without some form of map that helps you navigate the space, that helps you find out um, what data is available and how it's related. And we're starting to produce some of these maps for open data. And the chart on the screen here shows you some analysis we've done on the basis of the metadata tags that people within government put on their data sets. And it shows you um, nodes, which are those tags. And the larger the node, the more times that tag is used. And the spacing between these nodes, the connections that you can see, represent how far away they are in, in concept and connection. And you can start to dig into this now to see whether or not the data that you have is representative of the whole context that you're trying to understand. Because there's nothing worse, and I've experienced it myself, there's nothing worse than having a question that you want to answer, <coughs> going to find the data that you think answers the question, and then three months later you realize there was another data set that you, you could have used but didn't because you just were not aware of it. So these sorts of maps are important. And understanding how health is related to the economy and to business is important because there are a lot of steps in between that might help you form the, the, the picture that you need to answer the question. How many of you use um, these portals, by the way, out of interest? Okay, so, so, so plenty. How many of you know what you are looking for when you go to use those portals? Okay, substantially lower number. So, so you're using, I hope, those portals as a way of exploring, but are they genuinely a good way into the data? So we, we, we use a lot of this data to answer some interesting questions, important questions, um, such as, why does it cost one surgery eight pounds to prescribe aspirin and another surgery 9p? And, and what's the spread? And how much money could be saved as a consequence of, of making sure that uh, perhaps a centralised approach to purchasing drugs was made? There's been a lot of debate about the difference between drugs on patent 
and generic drugs and the differential in cost between them and why GPs aren't prescribing more generics over patented drugs and how much money could be saved if they did. But it's not quite as simple as that because you can see that there are considerable spreads of cost for a lot of these drugs. Why is that? And how can we use this data now to start to build in cost savings for um, the NHS? And why did we spend more money per person in the North than in the South? Is that because we've got other conditions that are affecting those people in the North versus the South? And that means that we have to spend more money to deal with those. I'm doing a piece of work at the moment which is looking at the impact of demographic, economic and behavioural change on retail bank and building society networks. And most of my grey hair is caused by this project because it highlights both the fantastic opportunities of open data and also a large number of the problems and pitfalls. The fact that a lot of data is made available for free means that I can access a, a really rich resource. But the trade-off comes from having to do an awful lot of preparation of that data before it can be properly analysed. And there are questions, and I've, I've actually been questioned myself, about whether or not it would be more cost-effective to go out to an Experian, a CACI, a core credit, and just buy this data because it's been prepared, cleansed, and, and therefore should hopefully slot seamlessly into the analysis I do. So there are a number of opportunities and also a number of challenges. The great thing about open data, it's free to use. And actually, if you're not already using it, then you really should be, because it is such a vast resource. Uh, and quantities are increasing all the time. But the question that you have to ask is, is the data itself relevant to the question that I want to answer? I ran a, a roundtable event last year, which I um, demonstrated the newly relaunched data.gov.uk. And someone in the audience was from Birmingham, and he said, well, I'm really quite interested in finding out a bit more about, about Birmingham. So we drew a bounding box around Birmingham on data.gov.uk and the first data set that came up was the prevalence of burrowing mammals. And I, I mean, I, it may have been of some interest to him, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't dig, if you'll excuse the pun. But it just goes to show that releasing large quantities of data that is not meaningful when it comes to some of the decisions and questions that you have is not helpful. There are some useful proxies and some proxies that hopefully will come over time. So the Department of Energy and Climate Change is looking at releasing energy performance certificates, or that data, which is a fantastic proxy for points of interest around the country by looking at the ownership of individual buildings, not just their energy performance, but being able to use that information in, in alternative ways. And there are ethical considerations. I appreciate you might not be able to see, but. Does anyone know what that map is on the bottom right-hand side? It, it, it's difficult to see. It's, it's a map showing the locations of all registered firearms in one county of the US, which is available publicly. Um, and a newspaper following a number of shootings in America last year published this on their website. And this is, this is I can drill into it down to very, very find accuracy and find out individual homes that have registered firearms. Now, of course, that's um, quite sensitive information and actually quite useful if you're planning to burgle a house because you'd rather choose a house which doesn't have a registered firearm than one that does. So the gun lobby in America, in, um, in response to this map, published, they searched online for detailed data and they published the names, addresses, mobile phone numbers and home telephone numbers of all the journalists who've been involved in writing the story. So, so the challenge with open data, like any other data, is just because it is available doesn't mean that you should use it. And the unintended consequences, or even the consequences, may be such that you need to think twice. So bigger mobile 
Um, I mean, if, if there's ever an area that qualifies as big, then I think mobile is it. The, the, the sheer amount of data that is collected is extraordinary. Um, and we did some work uh, last year looking at the Queen's Diamond Jubilee pageant. And we took data, anonymized and aggregated mobile, mobile location data, to look at what sort of things um, could be useful to primarily people in government, but elsewhere as well. And we looked at things like um, the population flows and how, um, how that changed over time. In particular, looking at different areas and different places um, to understand the flows. And we looked at um, what the normal patterns of use were versus the uses on that day. So we could look at the hotspots. And, and we looked at how things changed over time. Where were their areas getting quieter? Where were their areas getting busier? And we could also look at the flows of people between these places. And we've heard quite a lot of, about this this morning, about how potentially useful this data is in, in terms of replacing some of the um, generalised statistics that we have about residential populations. And we could do it at a national scale and understand the, 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 the linkage between events that occur at the same time. And we can start to look at how this might impact on law enforcement, where there are events running, where there are, where there are um, very public events running, how do crowds gather, and that could be useful from a law enforcement perspective as much as it can be from an advertising perspective. And then there are questions about demographics, looking at where people started their journeys from. So using the traditional demographic data, can you then start to form a view in close to real time of the demographics of the population at a particular time based on where they started their journeys? Can you do some analysis about where they are likely to want to go back to and the, the transport nodes and the network that they're going to use and therefore make some decisions about crowd control, yes, but also advertising at those particular locations? So mobile phone data can provide huge amount of benefit to organisations because it, it can... It can supplement. I'm not going to say that it will re ever replace some of the, the data that we always use. But it can supplement that to provide a much, much richer insight and a timely insight into journey time, population flows, and the demographics of the people that are in a particular area. But like open data, the benefits come with some challenges. So yes, we might be able to look at a whole country. We might be able to to get near real-time data that allows us to form these views over the course of a day, over the course of a night, about the population and the flows that exist. We can get a large sample size, so some of the networks we've heard about today cover a substantial proportion of the UK population. So it doesn't take too much extrapolation to get represent nationally representative samples. And theoretically, it comes with lower costs because here you can get data which is very, very rich rather than having to go through the effort of finding other sources of data and the analysis that you have to do in order to try to, to replicate it. But as we've heard, if it's not GPS enabled, then the location accuracy is, is questionable. So while you might be able to tell how many people are in a particular area, you don't know whether or not they actually went into a store. So you need to start to think about whether or not other technologies are needed to give you that seamless view of where people are. Of course, there's a potential for demographic bias in this as well, or statistical discrimination, because the demographics of people who are using these phones are, are, are different. People in different age bands uh, tend to use these devices differently. So you have to make sure that you are genuinely looking at a representative sample. And then there's something I call the beautiful irony of mobile location data. So for the people who, are, who you are tracking with this data, location is becoming less important to them. Because actually it doesn't matter where they are, 
when they are engaging with businesses. And, and, and this, this is the irony. So you might have fantastic precision about where people are, but actually less information about the, 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 strictly the, the things that they're doing. And then we have these ethical considerations, which, as Max said, are hugely important. So we run a survey of the public's attitudes to collection and use of data by organisations every year. And it demonstrates, I think, unequivocally that there's a massive gap between what businesses want to do with this data and what consumers want businesses to do with this data. And that gap needs to be closed through trust and through transparency. And our data shows that the more effort you put into helping people understand what data is collected and how it's used, the, mu the more likely they are to then trust you in terms of the provision of services and how you then treat that data and pass it on to others. And the effect is quite considerable. So uh, around 20 to 30 percent of people say they are not confident in the way that organisations handle and use their data. If you tell them how you use that data, if you're transparent in that sense, and you actively seek consent, then around three quarters of people will say that they are then confident in those services. So it's, it's, a, it's a transformative effect. And what that means is privacy and trust become competitive differentiators for this new mobile and digital consumer. So just some concluding thoughts. And I wanted to go back to some of the basics of analytics because there's some, some really important points here. And it's very easy to get seduced by this fantastic power of analytics for finding out insights that you just never knew existed before and forget that those insights only come on top of a stack of other stuff which might not appear um, as productive or as useful, but if you get wrong, will never allow you to get to the insights. So if 80% if, if of the value comes from 20% of the, the effort, the analytics, but the remaining 80% of the effort is, isn't right, then you won't succeed. And about 50%, 50 to 60% of the projects I run end up finishing before we get to the insight because we have an original hypothesis or a question which is just there's no data to support it or the data is not suitable or accurate or for a number of other reasons so so when you're exploring data in this way this new universe this new world of data you have to be prepared for it to fail not every piece of data analysis is going to lead to fantastic insight. So it makes sense to think about the way that you approach this data in, in quite a logical manner. And there are a number of steps to take when it comes to data analysis. And the first step is, what is the question that you are trying to answer? What is your business objective? What is your hypothesis? Because without a question, it's very, very difficult to invest money or to justify the investment of money in a fishing trip or an exploratory trip into data. And it's only once you understand the question that you can start to look for the data that might address that question. And it's absolutely essential that you consider all the sorts of data that might help you answer that question. Because, as I said, there's nothing worse than coming to the end of a project and finding out that there's another piece of data that could have helped you along the way. So question and data precede the technology. And all this talk of big data and Hadoop and Hive and everything else is very, very seductive, but it is not the first thing that you need to think of. And actually it is an exploration. When you start to put the hypothesis, the data and the technology together, then that is where the exploration begins. And proof of concepts, technology demonstrators are a way into this new world of big data. And it's only when you've, you've found those 
50% of projects that work, that allow you to make the better decisions, that justify the investment in the bigger projects, that you can really start to begin to go to work and start to industrialise and build out. And this process takes an awful lot of commitment, an awful lot of money and an awful lot of time. But actually, getting it right is what matters going forward. And my final slide, because I'm very conscious that lunch is waiting for us, is this one. We are, as Ipsos Mori would say, entering the measured millennium, where everything is measured. There are sensors everywhere. And, and one of the fundamental challenges I see with all of this data is it allows us now to be incredibly precise. But the challenge is, again, from more than 100 years ago, is it is better to be vaguely right than precisely wrong. And actually, I put a lot of stock in some of the old ways, the current ways of doing things, of using some of that residential data, for example, because I know I'm making some approximations and some assumptions, but it is better to be approximately right. And I, actually, I was staggered by some of the, the accuracy of Andy's forecasts in the first presentation of the morning using some of these traditional data sources. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. I hope something that gives you some pause for thought when it comes to the opportunities of data. I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, you and I have talked about some of these issues before, but can I just give one example of something that's happened recently, which I'd value your advice on. Um, last week, the UK Statistics Authority published a report on uh, official statistics in the context of a Scottish referendum. This is serious stuff, because uh, if you go to Edinburgh, you find that people are talking about nothing else, and it will so obviously spread to, to England quite soon. What that report demonstrates are that out of the many different data series which are available, some are completely compatible across England and Scotland. Some are monumentally incompatible because there are different assumptions built in, different classifications and so on. My sense is that we've done something of a service by highlighting those uh, and ONS are going to produce a, a catalogue of uh, compatible data quite soon. But I don't have any understanding about the data we've been talking about this morning, about what is, how would I know what's compatible with what? Do you have any advice on, on how I might um, stop myself making a fool of myself by mixing up data which are thoroughly incompatible? A, a, a terrific question. I'm sure there are, there are some great minds in the room who will have a better answer than, than I. And I said that most of my grey hair has been caused by this one project and sorting out with open data, things like different geographical classifications that exist, has been extremely challenging. And I'm sure the community here understands that, you know, local authority boundaries versus output area classifications, or postcodes and lat longs, and putting that into the mix. But it does extend cross-border. So for example, if I want population projections as open data rather than purchasing them from a data provider, then I've got to go to the ONS, to Stats Wales, and to the Scottish Government to get that information. The formats are completely different. Uh, and if I want to get... Um, and the algorithms used may be different as well. Com completely. So if I want population projections by age band, or, or even population from current census by age band from Scottish Government, I've got to request it specifically because they don't make it available. Whereas in England and Wales, I can get that information. Um, so I think there's, there's huge um, progress that needs to be made in terms of standardisation across national boundaries, but actually even within national boundaries, which would be transformative, I think, in terms of the way that that data, that open data, can then be used. I, I don't know what the solution is, um, but certainly it is, it is something that pressure may well 
change. Everyone's obviously hungry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Bobby. So thank you for all this morning's presenters. Please take your thoughts from this morning to the workshops this afternoon. And I think now we're breaking for lunch back at 2 o'clock. Keith, is that right? Okay, we'll see you all at 2 o'clock. Thank you.